Sustainability, the Potsdam Dialogues, science for a safe tomorrow. Welcome to the very first edition of the Sustainability Podcast, the Potsdam Dialogues. My name is Jan Rockström. I'm a professor in Earth System Science and one of the directors of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. I'm also the host of this podcast on sustainable solutions for planet and people. The focus of today's podcast is on nothing less than the future health of our planet and all people in the world. We will be talking about what we eat and how we produce it of agriculture and the whole wide food system, one of our key life support systems. Humans have been cutting down trees, transforming ecosystems, tilling the soil and planting crops for some 10,000 years. This is the very basis for our modern civilizations. Agriculture is the single largest sector emitting greenhouse gases. This is scientifically established, amounting to some 25% globally and roughly 50% of global methane emissions. But agriculture poses much more pressure on Earth than that. As the world's largest consumer of fresh water, 70% of withdrawals globally, single largest cause behind land degradation and biodiversity loss, the major driver behind nitrogen and phosphorus overloading in our waterways and coastal zones, and key driver behind chemical pollution from pesticides, threatening health and the resilience of humans and natural systems. It is, to quote Alan Matthews, one of the guests today, a broken system. And now we are at 7.7 billion people in the world, very likely to rise to 10 billion by the end of this century. The pressure from agriculture is very likely at risk of rising even further, unless we make a global turnaround, a sustainable transformation of the broken food system. The new Common Agricultural Policy, CAP for short, the topic of today, should put a break on this worrying development in the European Union. Currently, negotiations on the new CAP are about to be finalized, with about 387 billion euros to be allocated to the different EU member states over the next seven years. One of the main issues here is how can a new agricultural policy fit within the European Green Deal? How can it contribute to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by 55% as now stipulated by the European climate law within the next decade and reach the big goal of climate neutrality by 2050? In short, how can agriculture become shifting from being one of the biggest culprits in the world to becoming part of the solution. Our guests on today's podcast work right at the midst of these challenges. They are leaders and experts on the grand challenge of the CAP and the EU's green future. Welcome, Franz Timmermans and Alan Matthews. Great to have you with us on the podcast. Franz, you are the Executive Vice President of the European Commission, you lead the Commission's work on the European Green Deal, one of the major, major futures for Europe. You recently helped negotiate the final agreement on the first ever European climate law. And this coming month, together with your team, you'll be guiding the final negotiations on the common agricultural policy. So you're sitting right at the center of this whole agenda. Alan, Alan Matthews. Great to have you here, Professor Emeritus of the European Agricultural Policy at Trinity College in Dublin. You've been a member of Ireland's Climate Change Advisory Council, and you regularly, I mean, I love your blogs. It's just fantastic. Uh, what, a, what a source of knowledge on the CAP reform, which you define in your subtitle as Europe's common agricultural policy, which is broken. Let's fix it. So with that, let's jump into the discussion. My first question goes to you, to you, France, to kind of kick off the discussion. We, we know that the only way to land the Paris Climate Agreement is to get a full alignment between the CAP and the European Green Deal. So, so France, what, what are, from your perspective, the most important challenges that the CAP reform now needs to solve in order to enable that alignment with with the Paris Climate Agreement. And I, and I ask this following one of your recent tweets after your meeting with Greta Thunberg, Adelaide Chandler, Chandlier, and, and Luisa Neubauer, the Fridays for Future youth representatives, where you stated, the commission remains committed to make the CAP fulfill the objectives of the Green Deal, while not easy 
it is still possible. Well, could you expand on that, that it is still possible? Franz? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge um, that there will be no revolution in the cap. Um, that's simply um, uh, how the situation is. Uh, too much anxiety in in uh, agricultural communities, too little trust in the strength of uh, the change that needs to come, etc. So what we're doing is pushing the envelope as far as we can. Um, for that, um, you know, if you look at, at what when when the cap was created, actually by a Dutchman uh, many many years ago, uh, Sikkel Monsholt, there were actually three three goals that they needed to achieve. Uh, first of all, to produce enough food. Um, um, and that is no longer an issue. Uh, the EU produces uh, a lot of food, exports a lot of food, and wastes about 20% of the food we produce. Uh, so there, um, there is uh, enough room for change, uh, and it would leave enough room uh, for changing our policies. The, the, uh, the second issue was to provide good quality food at uh, moderate prices. Well, that's a, a tremendous success. Um, but that's because we've never counted the external costs. We've never counted the, the, the pressure on, on, uh, our environment. Uh, we've never learned to live within the boundaries that the planet has set. And we now need to, to learn to do that. And in doing this, we also never really, uh, attained the third goal of the common agricultural policy. And that is to, uh, uh make sure that farmers have a decent income. Um, and because we've never attained the third goal, uh, we now have difficulties in convincing the farming communities to change in the right uh, uh, direction. So I think it all starts with a credible way of assuring a better income for farming communities. Now, if you understand that in, on the European scale, 80% of the money is going to only 20% of the beneficiaries. I call them beneficiaries because very often they're not even farmers the landowners and the companies that own land, there is where we would need the big shift to then be able to um, uh, create enough support for uh, what we've described in, in, in our biodiversity strategy and a farm-to-fork uh, strategy. So I think the crucial element here is to, to have a, a keen eye on the income of farmers, of farming communities. And then we need to apply all the modern technology we have we need to bring all the invention that we have to farming communities. We need to bring broadband to even the most remote areas in the European Union. Then I think if, if we could do these two things. So first of all, show that we can, we can um, assure a, 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 a decent income for farming communities, which, by the way, would solve another one of their major problems, which is young people not wanting to go into farming, uh, combining it with uh, eco schemes. So no longer just... Uh, spending all the uh, first pillar money without conditions, but attaching conditions also to first uh, pillar money. Uh, hopefully, you know, moving this the envelope a bit further than what what's happening now with the negotiations, um, so that we can get the amount of money uh, for eco schemes in the neighbourhood of fifty billion. Uh, then I think we can really start seeing a change. I think, but we need to meet these conditions. Just handing that over in a way to you, Alan, because. You are one of the most updated persons continuously scrutinizing the, the common agricultural policy and particularly now in, the, in this reform phase. And, and you're quite critical in, in your assessment. So, so do you share, France, if I may say so, quite optimistic assessment here and, and identifying where, where the key issues are? I mean, what's, what's broken here that... Um, or is, is France fixing this, basically? I would share a lot of the commissioner's diagnosis. Uh, as he points out, the cap was put in place initially uh, as a support for production in Europe. Uh, it then became largely an instrument to transfer income to farmers. And it is important in that respect. Uh, around, uh, On average, across the European Union, around 50% of uh, farm income is actually coming from public transfers, both directly from the cap budget and from member uh, states in, in terms of co-financing. Much of that uh, spending, as, as the commissioner uh, has highlighted, is both uh, ineffective, uh, it's inefficient, and it is inequitable. Um, but we have been very slow to change it and very slow to redirect 
uh, that funding to meeting the challenges uh, that, Johan, you have uh, identified at the outset of this pod- podcast and which uh, clearly also are challenges for European agriculture. So we do have a situation where we are asking farmers to do more, uh, to address uh, the, um, the, the uh, nutrient pollution, to reduce their use of pesticides and antimicrobials, uh, to increase uh, the area under organic farming. And it is clear that farmers are concerned or worried that this may uh, lower the overall um, take, if you like, that they, they get, the overall support that they get from the common agricultural policy. But it is a necessary transformation. And I think that's a message that we need to get across. Yes, yeah, so I, if I may um, kind of follow up with you, Franz Timmermans, directly there, because um, you, you gave quite some reassuring first statements on, on let's say, what's going on right now in, in the new CAP reform. Uh, and, and you said that you're relatively confident. I'm, as a, as, a, as a climate scientist coming into this, just looking at the numbers that we know we need to not only cut emissions by half between now and 2030, in the energy sector, we have to do it across all sectors, including agriculture. And, and so far, I've not seen numbers that really align with, with those levels. How, how do you see that link between the cap reform and, and, and the green deal that you've been championing, that you are championing, which, which after all has to do with, with decarbonizing the European economy? In our analysis of what needs to be done to, to make the green deal a success, we have identified three areas that are particularly challenging, uh, and that's uh, the built environment, uh, that's uh, transport, and it's agriculture. And and I have to say, of these three, um, agriculture is is arguably the most challenging uh, because the um, in all three areas you will see people who are uh, reluctant to change because they fear uh, the change. They don't fear the uh, outcome of the change, they fear the transition, not not the end situation, but the transition. And this is more so in in agriculture than in the, even in the other two uh, sectors. So I'm under no illusion this will be easy. Uh, I'm even quite frustrated by how things have been going so far in the tri- uh, trilogues. I think we have created an opening. I think we have opportunities but still, I don't want to be unkind to anyone, but still, there's still a feeling of this is a closed shop. Uh, people like myself should stay out. This is something we've always done uh, amongst ourselves, us, the people in the agricultural uh, sector. And sadly, also in national politics, you know, mostly heads of state and government would rather not touch the issue because they fear the electoral consequences of having to face uh, angry farmers. Whereas, uh, my, I would maintain that, you know, if you don't do anything, if you don't uh, uh, speed up the change, um, you ain't seen nothing yet in terms of angry farmers. Because if we continue like now, it's only a matter of time that farmers will be really in trouble. And then it's too late. Then we will have reached some tipping points. And then it's too late. So, so I mean, the, the one thing that really sometimes... Uh, uh, is incredibly frustrating is that you know you need to change and the change needs the pace of change needs to be faster but at the same time the people who would benefit from that change are amongst the most reluctant to embrace that change not because they don't like the end situation they don't they fear the transition uh, to, to be very clear I, I'm nowhere near as optimistic as I might have sounded in my first answer but we do have some welcoming developments. Um, but for developments to be speeded up, we need more comfort for the agricultural community and much, much more engagement from the rest of society uh, uh, to, to make sure uh, we get things going. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very interesting point. And, and if I may follow up with another question to, to you, uh, Franz, which is, I mean, Alan pointed out the the journey that the cap has been doing from its origins basically being a a production maximizing policy scheme to increasingly being uh, a transfer of income to farmers and and I would even argue that many times the the efforts have actually been 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 really 
aimed at at more sustainable management of agricultural landscapes, but you can then argue that it hasn't had the impacts. And then you you put your finger on something that I think you're absolutely right on, that this will fail unless we secure the livelihoods of the farming community, a vibrant farming community across the European Union. How how do you see the economic policy measures there? How how to how to marry the magic of internalizing externalities and putting the right price on on food so that it aligns with sustainability criteria at the same time securing a minimum wage for farmers so you don't get the kind of social tipping points that that you allude to. I mean, uh, do do you, do you see that that little magic uh, mix uh, emerging? Uh, in the cap reform right now? It's an extremely narrow path. Um, and it goes way beyond the cap reform. If you want to do something about this, you need to address the whole food chain, uh, 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 right up to uh, our citizens, the consumers. We need to have more clarity about the real cost of food. We need to have more clarity about the climate climate consequences of our consumption patterns, about the consequences for our health, we need to have better informed citizens, more engaged citizens. Uh, it's a really, really tall, tall order here. Uh, and, and the cap reform in and by itself can't do that. But the one thing that I believe is important is that we are now talking about really targeting not just the second pillar, a uh, very limited number of funds that were always directed at structure, but instead of what could have been possible a huge shift from the first to the second pillar in, in, in terms of money to go into the first pillar and, and direct more first pillar funds towards better, newer, more sustainable uh, uh, farming uh, practices. I think that is quite a change. Of course, it's not the, the, the radical change that, that, that the climate activists would like and perhaps I would like, but within the uh, political realities we have to face and within, uh, on the basis of the need to keep the farming communities on the side of those who embrace change, I think the eco schemes uh, could be an interesting instrument to 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 get us on another path, and especially to 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 give some hope to an increasing group of young farmers who do understand the need to change and who want to be part of that change. It could be helpful in looking at this um, apparent trade-off between climate action in agriculture and uh, the income effects to to drill down a little bit and, and look at the uh, what are the actual uh, gases that agriculture uh, uh, is responsible for, and uh, because it's a very different profile of gases to the uh, to the fossil fuel. Uh, sector. So agriculture produces nitrous oxide, a very powerful greenhouse gas, and also methane. Uh, but through their management of land, farmers also have the opportunity uh, both to emit carbon dioxide, uh, if you're uh, managing, for example, organic soils um, and, and, and uh, plowing them, but you can also use your land management to, to sequester carbon. I think if we drill down into each of those gases, so for example, take the nitrous oxide, where uh, the, the nitrogen use efficiency in, in European agriculture is quite low. A lot of nitrogen that farmers apply is simply not taken up by their plants or by grass. Uh, it escapes into the atmosphere um, uh, as ammonia or nitrous oxide, or it's leached into waterways and, and causes pollution. So if we could improve uh, our use of nitrogen, um, it's a win-win situation. Farmers need to apply less uh, of an expensive input, uh, and yet farmers, uh, yeah, plants uh, get the same nutrition. So there are potential win-wins. Uh, when it comes to methane, um, uh, one of the issues here is that farmers uh, don't have technological options at the present time. There are feed additives under uh, investigation, indeed, uh, uh, one that is uh, under uh, waiting approval uh, from the uh, European Food and uh, Food Safety Agency at the moment, um, which may be relevant uh, at least for indoor uh, systems. Uh, it may not be uh, much help for the more uh, pastoral uh, animal agriculture agriculture, uh, at least in the immediate future. Um, but methane is an interesting gas, and I'd be interested in the commissioner's view on this. There is an argument that methane is a flow gas, 
Uh, that is to say that uh, as long as we are not increasing our methane emissions, they are not accumulating in the atmosphere. They are being destroyed within a relatively short period of time. So that's a very different uh, action to the longer lived gases, such as carbon dioxide or, or nitrous oxide, where as long as you emit, even if you're reducing your emissions, so long as you, as you have positive emissions, they are adding to the concentration in the atmosphere, adding to global warming. Now, we do need to reduce methane because uh, otherwise the um, transition for the fossil fuel sector is simply uh, uh, too dramatic. So we do need to create some space, if you like, for the, uh, uh, for the fossil fuel transition. But is there a case for arguing that if we reduce methane, which effectively is cooling the atmosphere. Is there an argument for saying that actually we should incentivize farmers by paying them for that? Uh, so rather than see it as a, as a, as a burden, that we actually find ways to, uh, to incentivize uh, the reduction in methane. And then, of course, you have the carbon dioxide, which is the, the land sector and, and the carbon farming, which the commission has uh, highlighted as a potential uh, new business model for, for farmers. Um, and we have to wait to see uh, some of the legislative uh, framework to ensure that uh, whatever happens there is credible, it's verifiable, uh, it, we can monitor it, monitor it and, and that we can actually capture the, uh, the gains in the national inventories and in our targets. We're trying to come up with a number of initiatives that would help reduce uh, uh, the methane uh, emissions uh, because we need, we need a more reduction than we get out of the current policies. Uh, the current policies would, would lead to about 29% of methane reductions in 2030. Uh, if we want to reach the at least 55%, uh, then we would need in methane to increase the reduction to about 35 to 37%. So how, how can we, we get there? I think in agriculture, we can reduce uh, methane by mitigation technologies uh, and, of course, via, via the, um, the, strate the CAP uh, strategic plans. So we're also looking, of course, into the technical solutions uh, to reduce uh, these emissions. Uh, uh, as Alan has said, uh, uh, feeding techniques, uh, I think they are developing. Um, uh, the one additive he mentioned, and indeed it's, it's mainly for uh, livestock that's been fed, uh, being fed inside. Uh, uh, you know, just a, a small additive could, could lead to a reduction of methane emissions from dairy cows by about 30%. You know, that, that's, that's quite something if you can do that. But, that's still awaiting authorization. But if that's the sort of technical solution we can uh, find that would be, uh, um, uh, I think, useful. Now, the issue Alan brought up, um, I want to study that, but I also want to, to hear perhaps Potsdam's view uh, on this because it, it sounds quite interesting, but, uh, but, but are, we, are we safe on the science? Because that's not where my strengths lie. Uh, I'm a politician and I'm someone who's trying to change um, uh, uh, the, the, a couple of paradigms. But if, if this sort of approach could help us change a paradigm and get more buy-in from the agricultural community, I'm always interested, of course, to see if that could be an approach. Mm. No, I mean, to, to start with, uh, Alan is putting, I mean, Alan, you're putting your finger right, right at the heart of, of something that scientifically is, is, I would argue, very well established today that the final battleground, whether or not we land the Paris Agreement successfully, is no longer whether we're able to, to phase out the black carbon flows from fossil fuels, but rather whether we're able to transition the global food system from from source to sink and that has to do with nitrous oxide methane and all the the land use change related carbon dioxide fluxes so so this is this is a i think a, a correct assessment i also think that the that the research on um, on feed additives for ruminant livestock is is interesting but but i haven't seen as yet uh, i mean pick does not potsdam institute does not have a position here, but we're doing quite a lot of scenario analysis on the potentials. And so far, we haven't seen that, that uh, methane reducing feed additives can, can scale up uh, to a significant enough level, which means, which, or which suggests that it would have to be uh, combined with strategies also of, of a, of a 
reduction in in size of uh, of livestock uh, around the world including the european union so that it's uh, it's not kind of a, a a silver bullet strategy to to simply continue as today and and i raise this because we also know that there is another broken part of the food system which is that the intensive uh, meat based indoor industry in europe and and in the world is based on grain fed uh, feedstocks which generally come from across the atlantic and many times from the amazon rainforest and it's soya that has led to loss of biodiversity and deforestation in the amazon which then comes linearly to europe which is then leading to methane uh, fluxes but also to to nitrous oxide from from manure which so it has these additive linear upstream and downstream uh, problems which which I think adds to your point, Alan, about the broken system. I mean, I, I'm, I'm even tempted to, to throw the ball back to you, France, and say, personally, I would even say that, that the discussions today that you are part of, of, uh, in the European Union on border adjustment taxes to, to start putting a price on carbon for imported goods could actually benefit the, the cap reform. Indirectly, because it would internalize the externalities on 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 feed, uh, on soya feed imports, which are part of the problem of methane fluxes in the livestock sector. So, so it's all interconnected, um, not only in terms of feed additives, but also in terms of the whole the whole production system. But, but do you do you share that diagnostic? I absolutely do, um, and and we haven't we haven't said a lot yet about NOx, but if you look. If you look at the country I know best, uh, it's almost paralyzed yeah. by the NOx issue um, um, because it affects, of course, agriculture, but also uh, transport, the built environment. So the three elements of the um, uh, most complicated changes we need, I mentioned in the beginning, are affected in the Netherlands uh, by NOx directly. Uh, and and there are no easy solutions, but uh, it has a lot to do with the intensity of agriculture and especially animal husbandry. Um, and, and of course, you know, if you, if you're just to, to continue one sentence on that, con- on my country, if you, if you have, what is it? 42,000 square kil- kilometers, 17 and a half million people. And still in terms of value, you're the second exporter of agricultural goods in the world. Uh, then you, 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 you must understand that if you then have to learn as a global community, to live within planetary boundaries, this leads to huge re-evaluations of, um, of the agriculture sector in certain areas. And, and, and um, of course, this has a huge international uh, dimension, including with uh, calm border adjustment, because if we're asking our farming communities to change in a certain direction, and then we have no checks or no, uh, no um, uh, criteria, for produce we import from outside the EU, uh, you you create uh, a, a level of carbon leakage or fi- uh, unfair competition that is unsustainable. Yeah. So, of course, uh, our carbon border adjustment mechanisms uh, that we uh, might propose um, uh, in in July, uh, you know, and are not uh, primarily uh, targeted towards the the agriculture sector. Obviously, do have implications because it, it will. Focus the minds of people on the possible carbon leakage effects of our climate policy as we will be implementing it. No, I think that that's uh, well. In my mind, that aligns very much with with the science. What, what's your take on this, Alan? Well, I think it's it will be extremely difficult to implement a border carbon adjustment tax for for food products simply because the. Uh, the production systems are just so different in different uh, countries um, and and trying to evaluate the ambition, if you like, of climate policy in different countries in order to set the tax is, is going to be difficult. It's also arguable whether it's in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, where in a sense we, got a, we reached an agreement because uh, we did agree that it was up to each country to establish 
you know, their level of ambition, uh, given their uh, their starting points. And uh, if we as the European Union come around and then uh, sort of say, well, we don't think your level of ambition is high enough, um, you know, it, it sort of uh, raises a question about the uh, uh, the basis for the Paris Agreement. But I think we can certainly uh, take steps uh, within Europe. It's clear that where um, increased production is at the expense of our own environment, it simply doesn't make sense uh, to reduce either for uh, home or, or export uh, consumption. So we do need to see more rigorous enforcement of, uh, of, of, of regulations that are already in place. We have a nitrates directive, um, and, and yet many countries uh, are given derogations from it. Um, uh, I saw recently that the, the nine countries that surround the Baltic Sea, for example, uh, none of them live up to their um, uh, commitments uh, to reduce uh, nutrient le- uh, leakage into the into the Baltic Sea and, and, and the dangers of dead zones and so on. We certainly uh, need need to limit uh, animal agriculture to the um, uh, the boundaries in terms of environmental uh, boundaries that, 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 that exist. I suppose the other thing is that um, much of animal agriculture in Europe is actually very economically vulnerable. It's Despite the fact that there's uh, high uh, tariffs on the imports of uh, beef meat and, and, and sheep meat, for example, um, many um, uh, 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 grazing farms actually find it very difficult to uh, to remain viable and and uh, the cap payments are often up to 100% of their income and yet for biodiversity reasons um and and to maintain uh, what can sometimes be the most valuable uh, biodiverse uh, uh, areas are our, our natural grasslands in 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 Europe and um, we do need to uh, to support uh, that type of uh, farming so uh, you know whether we can reach the the, the this new equilibrium of, of sort of holding back the more intensive um, uh, producers, but supporting the the more extensive ones. This is something that I would hope uh, to see emerging in the in the national strategic plans uh, when they are developed in the coming twelve months. I'm absolutely not advocating uh, uh, CBAM for agriculture. Uh, I don't want that to be a misunderstanding. Absolutely not advocating that, but. The fact that we would, might have a carbon border adjustment mechanism in other sectors, perhaps steel, perhaps cement, will sort of uh, bring home the point that if we take the measures to implement the Paris Agreement and others take no measures to implement the Paris Agreement, we have a right to try and avoid carbon leakage and to make sure that we create a level playing field for our industry. I think I think that that's completely in line with the World Trade Organization uh, uh, criteria. In agriculture, I think... What we will see is, you know, there's increasing call across the European Union for us to do something about deforestation. And if, if we then understand uh, that our own, pa- our own behavioral patterns are linked uh, uh, with uh, uh, create more deforestation, then, of course, this will have consequences um, uh, for um, uh, behavioral patterns of our Citizens, and it might have consequences for measures we will have to take. We will have to have a discussion with Brazil, with Central Africa, with Southeast Asia about their their practices to help them prevent deforestation. Because I believe when we talk about primal forests, we're talking about global public goods. No, and and as you know, the the, the science is 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 unequivocal here that we need to keep the resilience in the Earth system regulating big biomes intact and and all the forest systems are included in that and that will determine our ability to to land safely within a paris climate range so so that's that that link is 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 now fully fully connected but i'd like to change tack a little bit in the last few minutes that we have and i'll I'll like to come back to your first point france which was about emphasizing the incomes in the in in the farming community across Europe, and particularly to to give a chance for for young farmers, and uh, I'm I'm thinking, um, I I am personally very much um, in favor of Alan's point here of if I perhaps use my own terminology here, but kind of uh, allowing farmers to become ecosystem stewards and be paid for that, to be paid for being active ecosystem stewards of all the the carbon farming and the eco schemes and, and biodiversity uh, 
standards set up and uh, uh how how do you see that um I mean, are you hopeful that the new cap reform will be able to kind of redirect uh, its its uh, subsidy schemes for that support for farmers, while at the same time actually trying to raise the cost of doing wrong? I mean, I, I think personally, for example, that the a key solution for for nitrogen, because we have so much technologies for precision farming today, and and there's just simply no no reason for leakage if you just put the right price on nitrogen and, and very few people are willing to to discuss that but you would love to see a, a cap reform with uh, raised raised prices for doing wrong and and massive support for doing right and 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 outcomes vibrant farming communities i mean could could you elaborate a little bit more on on how you see that flux of money going in the future yes i think i think we have an opportunity here Obviously, I would have liked to go a lot further than than what seems to be, you know, uh, the uh, compromise that we can reach uh, with um, with the co legislators. Uh, I would have liked to have been more ambitious, but still, I believe uh, we are moving in the right direction. Especially as you say, if we can increasingly incorporate the latest technologies into agriculture, if we can also use the not just the cap money, but the recovery funds to bring broadband to all uh, rural areas you know my 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 dream is just to have farmers across the european union even in the remotest area being able to do their farming with their cell phone uh tapping into the information they need uh, getting the information from the land directly using uh, uh, a remote sensing as to to help them uh, to do precision farming uh, reducing their administrative burden to be able to do things online and to let others uh, take over. I think there's a huge world that we can gain and, and the common agriculture policy uh, uh, can push us in the right direction. Uh, 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 but it's a much more, much more profound societal question because uh, there are two chasms in, I think, modern European society that need to be addressed. Uh, the one is uh, the difference in, in uh, levels of education. And the other is the difference between I would call them uh, hyper urban areas and all the rest, uh, mainly also rural areas. Increased deliverability of rural areas is, is the key element here. Why am I saying this? Because I think if you look at the initial outset of the common agricultural policy, the one thing that didn't succeed or one should say in many areas failed is to guarantee not just a fair income, but also a future uh, to farming communities. And I believe if you take a more holistic approach, about where our society is heading, and you place cap in that logic, then I believe we can push cap in the right direction. If you keep it isolated from all other developments, which sadly, many of the stakeholders within the cap still have that attitude, but if you keep them isolated, they will only start asking for more money for all policies and going, and, and, and you know, the, the saddest of all things is to see farmers go into the streets defending an interest that is not theirs. So we need to break through that logic and we can only do it if we look beyond the cap. Then the cap can be directed in areas in a better direction. I think the, I think the direction we need to go is clear. I would see it as being a little bit more bumpy, uh, maybe than uh, the commissioner's view. Um, uh, Johan, you're sitting there in, in, uh, in Potsdam. My understanding, for example, in Germany, uh, the agreement of the uh, German agricultural ministers uh, is that uh, they will use 25% of their Pillar 1 uh, budget for, for eco-schemes, very good, and they will transfer 15% of their Pillar 1 budget uh, to agri-environment uh, climate measures in Pillar 2. So that's, if you like, 40% of their Pillar 1 budget uh, that is no longer available, if you like, for direct income support in the way that farmers are, are, are used to it. Of course, uh, farmers can um, uh, draw down uh, these, uh, these 40%, uh, but they will have to work in a different way. They will have to set aside some of their uh, peat soils, for example, or re-wet them. Uh, they, will, um, they will have to invest in, in, uh, in uh, uh, different types of slurry spreading machinery so that they uh, reduce their nitrous oxide emissions. So there is a cost to, 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 to this transition. Uh, and it raises for me the question of 
is there the possibility to attract additional resources into the sector from not just from uh, from, from from the EU budget as such, but from, uh, if you like, private uh, sources or indeed the recycling of some of the carbon tax revenue that uh, that, that 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 might be created. Um, so clearly, the carbon farming uh, idea is, is is one. There may be other opportunities uh, uh, in terms of uh, producing industrial raw materials for the bioeconomy, which uh, will be promoted. Uh, uh, a more controversial uh, proposal is, of course, uh, producing renewable energy. But in some circumstances, in my own country, for example, in Ireland, I think this is a potential use of of, of land which uh, which would otherwise be used for for ruminant agriculture. But that idea that trying to identify additional uh, sources outside of the cap to try to compensate for, if you like, uh, what I think otherwise, you know, will be a, a seen as a hit on their income. And we do see uh, protests already in Germany. We see it in Spain and France. Um, it will be a bumpy ride ahead. This transition will not be painless. No, thanks. Thanks a lot, Alan. And, and that's actually a very nice place to, to round off this, this podcast. We could have continued. Uh, perhaps it's a, it's a, it's a first in, in a series of dialogues because we're right at the midst of such an important transition for agriculture in the world and certainly for the European Union. But I think your point about connecting this transition in the European agriculture policy across different economic sectors in, in societies. And of course, just as you're doing, Franz Timmermans, in connecting it with the European Green Deal. And I would argue also with the whole recovery investments post covid and now with with the with the reform of the common agriculture policy that's the way to go and we haven't even touched the point of all the synergies we have between health food and agriculture which of course is one area alan where where you could or should potentially find uh, synergetic financial means of of ensuring that europe has a vibrant sustainable resilient and and, and really future-oriented agricultural sector. It's been uh, fantastic to have uh, the two of you on this uh, first sustainability podcast, the Potsdam Dialogues. Franz Timmermans, Executive Vice President of the European Commission, and Alan Matthews, Professor at Trinity College in Dublin. My key takeaway here uh, is, is this integration of policy areas to really unleash the the, the necessary but also real potentials of a, of a resilient but also vibrant farming community across Europe over the years to come. Thank you very much. And with that, we uh, close this podcast. Thank you. You've been listening to Sustainability, the Potsdam Dialogues, science for a safe tomorrow. 